Hello everyone, welcome to my first lore video on Baldur's Gate 3. We will be discussing the character of Shah, Shadowheart, their backgrounds and devotion to her goddess. Now I'm not just going to delve into BG3, but also Forgotten Realms. If you don't know, Forgotten Realms is where Dungeons & Dragons takes place. That's not to say that a D&D campaign has to take place in the Forgotten Realms universe, but the assumed default setting of a playthrough is Forgotten Realms. And BG3 also uses this setting. As a heads up, there will be spoilers for X1, 2, and 3 of BG3, as we will be touching on some of Shadowheart's story. So, to avoid spoilers, please save this video for later, play some more of the game, and come back after. With that said, let's begin. Shadowheart is a character you can encounter at the very beginning of the game, and immediately we can learn a lot about her from her appearance alone. One of her most notable features is a circlet she wears around her forehead, a silver chain with a jet black circular gem in the centre. The same iconography can also be found all over her body armour. Without even speaking to Shadowheart, if you are familiar with Forgotten Realms, you will recognise this as a symbol of the goddess Shah, a black disc with a border of deep purple. These colours are also used extensively in her church and among her followers. Shah and clergy are fond of jewellery fashioned from obsidian, black onyx, amethyst and purple jade. And this is significant if you know who Shah is and what she represents. One of the dark gods, she is a deeply twisted and perverse being of ineffable evil and endless petty hatred and jealousy. And with this knowledge, it might change how you regard Shadowheart, which is probably why she doesn't reveal this of us at first. In fact, Shadowheart doesn't divulge any personal details. Later we learn that this was intended. All we know about Shadowheart is that she carries a mysterious artifact. Said artifact is highly sought after by many and contains great power within. There is a point in the story where Shadowheart uses the artifact as a last resort to save the group from visions and unending darkness. This understandably causes our party to confront Shadowheart about what earth she is carrying and who she really is. This is where we learn about who she serves. I... I am a servant of Shah. My home is a secret cloister in Baldur's Gate. I need to bring that artifact back there, no matter what. This is a massive confession, and eloquently put by Gale if you have him with you. You worship Shah? Try me. Depending on how you want to roleplay, this could be a deal breaker if you don't wish to have a Sharon in your party, or even someone who won't be open and honest with you. But we all have our secrets, don't we? Secrecy is everything for Shah's children. It's our code, our creed, our shield. I'm not sorry I kept this from you. Not one bit. Shadowheart wholeheartedly says she did not want us to know about this. This is one of the dogmas of the Shah faith. Dark followers are instructed to reveal secrets only to fellow faithful. Consorting with beings of good alignment who actively serve their deities is a sin, unless undertaken to the advantage of them in purely business dealings or to corrupt them from their beliefs into the service of Shah. Shadowheart reluctantly tells us the truth because she has no choice. If she wants to get to Baldur's Gate, the final destination of her mission, her best chance is with your party. She asks us to have an open mind because then she can justify revealing her secrets. Her joining the party is purely for business. But also, Shadowheart doesn't have much information to share with you anyway, because she has had most of her memories wiped. No matter how much you probe or change your phrasing, Shadowheart won't and can't share much with you. I can't tell you anymore. This mission required utmost secrecy. We all submitted to having our memories suppressed so that we couldn't betray Shah's confidence. The way she views it is that this is also a test for her. Show loyalty and devotion to her goddess and be rewarded at the end. Memory wiping in Forgotten Realms appears in a class called the Dark Cloaks. Dark Cloaks have a special perfume scent that some people swear 
has amnesiatic properties, and this is also demonstrated in their abilities. Dark cloaks can cast Forget once per level each day. A dark cloak of fifth level can utter a soothing word that will eliminate one bad memory from the victim. A dark cloak of seventh level has access to a special perfume. If the smeller fails a save versus poison, they are affected by a forget spell. And there may be a hint to this in BG3. When you get to the Shah Gauntlet in Act 2, enemies called Justicia Avengers have bundles of incense on them. This sweet, woody aroma may be a reference to the amnesiac perfume. But this practice is not just forgetting for forgetting's sake. Part of the ethos of Shah worship is that loss and pain go hand in hand. Loss is the nature of Shah of pains hidden but not forgotten. Vengeance is carefully nurtured away from the light, hidden from others. She is said to have the power to make her devout followers forget their pain. So whether it was Shah herself or one of her followers who personally wiped Shadowheart's memory, it was done to remove something painful. But this doesn't mean that Shadowheart doesn't still have a connection to pain. There are instances where we see her react to a glowing brand on her hand. Shadowheart, once again, cannot remember why she has this strange wound, but I will say now that this pain is connected to her lost memories. As we explore Act 1, slight hints are fed to us as to Shahart's background. For example, if you encounter a wolf, whether it's hostile or not, Shadowheart will become frightened, afflicting her with a status effect that means she cannot move. If you've managed to gain enough approval with Shadowheart, she will allow you to look into her mind and witness one of her few remaining memories. We see Shadowheart as a child, alone in the woods, face to face with a wolf. A masked figure appears behind her. Based on the symbol on her forehead, that familiar black circle, we can assume this is a Shah worshipper. We do not see her face, but we can see her purple-grey skin, indicative that she is a drow. Some drow who dwell in, or at least raid, surface lands in the south are known to worship the human deity, Shah. More of these masked figures appear, brandishing spears, and we hear them put down the wolf. Her, and those who saved me, and taught me her ways. The Mother Superior. She made me who I am. Mother Superior gives an indication of this person's ranking. Most Sharon clergy use such titles of address as Brother Knight or Sister Knight. To superiors they say Mother Knight or Father Knight. Other titles and their hierarchy may follow this format, with the novice adept of the night up to flame of darkness, a trusted archpriest of goddess. From what Shadowheart tells us, the Mother Superior was in charge of raising her, taking her under her wing into the Sharon family. This explains why Shadowheart's devotion is so deep. She was raised in this culture from a young age, and because of that, Shadowheart has dreamed rising to a particular rank. A dark justicia. As long as I've prayed to Lady Shah, I've wished to serve her as a dark justicia. There is scarcely a greater way to fully dedicate yourself to Lady Shah, save perhaps if you become the head of her church. I can only find one mention of a dark justicia in the Forgotten Realm source material, and it says, Clergy of the faith who have killed one of the clergy of Saluna are rumoured to gain access to an honorary order or secret society known as the Dark Justicias. I haven't mentioned Saluna yet, partly because she deserves her own dedicated video, so please let me know if you like that and if you're enjoying this style of video. As a brief summary, Saluna and Shah are both goddesses, twin sisters, and most importantly, rivals. Sharans and Salunites, the respective followers, are enemies of each other. So, as an act of loyalty, killing a Salunite for Shah is a rite of initiation into her intimate sect. However, in BG3, this is expanded upon. As Shadowheart puts it, The old ways were lost over time. Now some claim the rank simply by killing a single Salunite. But before, they were a true elite. In her opinion, 
Killing a Salunite is an easy way to become such an honoured position of Dark Justicia. This is the current day tradition, however an older, more fanatical way of proving yourself to be worthy exists. The Gauntlet of Shah. This is entirely organic and new material to BG3 to my knowledge. By passing Shah's trials, you'd be accepted, granted the honour and title of Dark Justicia and an audience with the Night Singer. But who is the Night Singer? Well, when you enter the gauntlet, there are magnificent statues everywhere. A lightly clothed figure, golden accessories and wearing a grand headpiece. Her eyes are concealed and her helm is shaped like a reverse dark crescent moon. Atop it, a deep black orb is nestled, the symbol of Shah. In temples, representations of the goddess are either a black sphere outlined in racing, magically animated flames of purple, or paintings of a beautiful human with long raven black hair dressed in swirling dark garb. She smiles coldly and her large eyes have black pupils and are otherwise solid purple. Shah is depicted in many forms, so are these statues meant to be her? In Faith and Avatars, we see an illustration of Shah mid-battle with her sister Saluna. Notably, she's brandishing two daggers. In the later 3.5 edition, Faiths and Pantheons, we see another illustration of Shah also dual-wielding daggers. And what do we find in BG3 but a statue with arms crossed over her chest, holding a short blade in each hand. Based on the shared feature, we can assume that this statue is the BG3 depiction of Shah. But returning to my first point, who is the Night Singer? Shah has two main avatars, and one of these is called the Night Singer, a 12 foot tall presence whose female form is masked in feathers of all sorts that trail away into an increasingly intangible cowed cloak of gigantic proportions that merges into any shadows and darkness present. She sings continually even when simply speaking and her song is hauntingly beautiful and tragic. This song is also used as an attack if you get into combat with the Night Singer. If you fail a saving throw against it, the song can either force the loss of an experience level, cause 3d8 points of unearthly chilling damage, inflict feeble-mindedness, or even cause death in all who hear it. Safe to say, you do not want to be fighting an avatar of Shah. Shah's other form is the Dark Dancer. Not as tall as the Night Singer, but still over seven foot tall, least exquisitely beautiful. She dances gracefully and alluringly, her jet black body sparkling with stars and her dark eyes two hypnotic orbs that can emit both harmful and beneficial gaze effects. These effects manifest in charm and enchantment magic spells at triple strength and with a minus three penalty to the target saving throw. Beings kissed by the dancer are forced into a choice between becoming her loyal servant or dying instantly, unless you make a successful saving throw against death magic. If you choose not to risk rolling, the charm will convert all your existing aims and views to align with Shah's. The charm is so powerful that being so affected would happily die for Shah. The charm can be dispelled only by using Wish or Limited Wish, one of a mortal's most potent spells possible. You alter the very foundation of reality by simply speaking what you desire. Uh, wish you to be. Which is why it's up to the discretion of the DM to maintain the game's balance if they permit it to be used. Shah also manifests as a purple-eyed face hanging in the darkness, wreathed in relentlessly whipping and coiling black tresses like the tentacles of the giant octopi, sometimes called the devourers of the deeps. Sometimes it would just be a single, steadily gazing purple eye at its heart. But even if that eye were absent, in the dark purple aura you would still feel like you were being watched constantly. In summary, Shah is depicted as feminine, incomprehensibly beautiful, 
and consistently associated with a black and purple colour scheme. So do we ever see what Shah looks like in PG-3? Yes, in Act 3, the climax of Shadowheart's quest, you were granted an audience with Shah. Her statue depictions were not far off, the same crescent headpiece, eyes concealed, but we see her enormous scale this time, much taller than the Night Singer described in the source material. Only her head and shoulders are visible, but they alone scale over 12 feet tall. Her voice does sound melody-like. If you had obeyed, there would be no pain. But you struggle on. You will make things worse for yourself. However, she also borrows physical features from the Dark Dancer. When we see her avatar, she appears to have that jet black skin that the Dark Dancer is described as having. As for what exactly Shah looks like, we will never truly know, because an avatar is simply a manifestation of a deity. This manifestation is not nearly as powerful and is merely a projection of a deity's power. In the same way that this avatar of Shah is a fraction as powerful as her true form is, her appearance is also likely to be a fragment of the true broader picture. We get another hint to Shah's appearance in Shadowheart's dark questline. I don't think it's fitting to call them the good or bad path, so I will be referring to them as the dark and light path. The dark path is to encourage her to become a dark justicia, and if she does, she will change her appearance in response. This hairstyle is closer to Lady Shah's own image. I did it to honour her. Instead of her blunt bangs and centre parting, Shadowheart now wears her hair with a side parting and no fringe. The hair is pushed to the sides. Although a subtle change, this was done with intent. This is how Shah wears her hair. However, I would argue that a more fitting change for this development would be for Shadowheart to let down her hair entirely. The fact that Shadowheart has jet black hair is significant, because such hair is seen as a symbol of the Dark Lady's pleasure and is left to flow unfettered and long. Compared to what happens if you choose Shadowheart's light path, you get a really shocking but positive impact when she shows you her new hair, and I feel like the dark path could have been more impactful, but that being said, I do like Shadowheart's plaited hairstyle, and keeping that really makes her unique and it suits her as well. But enough about aesthetics for now, let's talk about behaviour. To meet the avatar of Shah, you will have needed to make a game-changing choice in Act 2, kill or spare the Night Song, the Dark and Light Path. The Night Song lies in wait at the end of the Shah Gauntlet, and killing her is the final test of the Gauntlet. Because Night Song is supposedly a daughter of Saluna, Shah's enemy, hence proving oneself worthy of rising to the rank of Dark Justicia. This is Shadowheart's lifelong dream. It's up to you to decide if you want her to go through with it. However, as the Night Song warns, To be a Dark Justicia is to turn your heart from everything but loss. You will know no love, no joy, only servitude. This is foreshadowing. If you are pursuing Shadowheart romantically, letting her become a Dark Justicia will make your relationship a lot more complicated. Shadowheart will not be able to love you anymore. She expects me to fill my heart up with love for her alone, leaving no room for others. No room for us because her heart must belong entirely to Shah. That's not to say you won't be able to do romantic things with Shadowheart, it just means that this will be a less conventional relationship from here on out. And hey, who am I to judge? If you're down to desecrate some holy statues and have blasphemous relations in front of them, or whilst engaging in some blood play, well, that's what's in store for you with Shadowheart's dark path. To bring it back to Forgotten Realms, this kind of activity is most definitely part of Sharan culture. Because of the secrecy of Sharan worship, celebrations and holidays are not widespread or well known, but the few that do exist have everything to do with night and darkness. In fact, every night the Sharan clergy hold a ritual called nightfall, dancing, eating and drinking to celebrate the coming of darkness. Lay worshippers must attend at least one nightfall and must perform and report to their fellows 
least one small act of wickedness in salute to the lady every ten day. So this dark and disrespectful deed in front of a statue of Saluna would be considered a wicked act to please Shah. Other events include the rising of the dark, the coming of the lady, and the kiss of the lady. All occur at night and involve plotting, slaying, sacrificing, and feasting. Now, congregations like this sound evil. That's right, Shah's alignment is neutral evil. For those who don't know, an alignment is how you categorize your morals, ethics, beliefs, and behaviors. A character with a neutral evil alignment will do anything as long as it benefits themselves in some way. They will rob someone because they need the money or kill to remove an inconvenience. Not killing in the restless, senseless way that a chaotic evil character might do. But despite this, neutral evil is the most dangerous alignment of all because it represents pure evil, without honour and without variation. So why is evil such as this allowed to continue? Well, it's not for lack of trying. Places of worship and where followers of Shah congregate are always in secret. Shah's love of secrecy is strong. Her clergy work towards fulfilling her desire for secrecy by always acting through manipulation and behind closed doors intrigue. This is demonstrated where worship occurs. The temples are hidden and composed of underground cells. One notable temple in Surlacal is the local Thieves Guild headquarters. As you can probably imagine, an establishment such as this is unlikely to be in plain sight, especially not with a massive sign across the door saying, Thieves and Shah worshippers welcome here. A Shah and base of operations would be tough to locate. This is a mutually beneficial relationship, as the worshippers of Shah want their secrecy as much as the thieves do. And in some cases, these thieves and criminals will also worship Shah. She is also worshipped by many who favour dark surroundings or must undertake deeds or do business in darkness. So, in BG3, when you arrive at the titular Boulder's Gate in Act 3, there is a hidden temple of Shah in the city. This will be pretty hard to find with no clues. Unless you have Shadowheart in your party, you will have received a scout's tip about its location. The temple is through a secret underground passage inside of the House of Grief. On the face of it, it is an honest and well-meaning establishment to aid those going through loss, but as you and I know, loss has everything to do with Shah. The House of Grief isn't only a front for the temple, but also a recruitment point. Shah desires to bring all humans under her sway. Most folk will suffer loss and turn to her for peace, especially through vengeance, and the influence of all other faiths will be lessened. If a grieving individual came to this house for help, they would be vulnerable enough to be persuaded into joining a cult with the promise that their pain would be alleviated, bracing the darkness to help them forget. Despite Shah's evil alignment and her being the goddess of night, darkness and loss, there is another side to the goddess, a side that is actually beneficial. The Dark Cloaks are members of Shah's clergy that function as oracles and caregivers to the emotionally damaged. The Dark Cloaks bring the bliss of forgetfulness to such troubled souls. The Dark Cloaks have actually made some progress in seeing Shah's faith become a socially acceptable one. There is an argument here that Shah's dogma is considerate of other people hurting, but remember, she is neutral evil. She is doing this for her own benefit at the end of the day, to gain more loyal followers to do her bidding. One follower in particular, Shadowheart, was groomed by the Sharon cult to become Shah's next right hand. Her painful memories were removed, yes, but Shah was the reason for those memories in the first place. If you have saved Night Soul, she will be the one to tell you the truth. That memory of the wolf in the forest was falsified. They trained you well, trained you hard. Chiseled away any part of you that did not fit their plan. They made you forget. Instead of a wolf, Shadowheart's father was the one to be encroached upon by Sharon forces. Captured along with Shadowheart's mother, Shadowheart in turn was abducted and indoctrinated. If you killed Night Song, you will still get this reveal, but much later, 
and by Shah herself, who restores this part of Shadowheart's memory. But this wasn't for closure or satisfaction or an act of kindness. Shah orders Shadowheart to now kill her parents with this knowledge, or to experience loss, grief and forgetting again. Shah promises Shadowheart that if she does this, she will erase this memory and make her second in command. To make it even worse, it's also revealed here that Shadowheart was made to constantly visit her parents in this prison, torture them, and her memories would be wiped after every time. What have you done to them? We, child, we did this to them together. My power and your will. And this most likely started when she was still a child. Interestingly, this could be connected to why Shadowheart has the name she does, Shadowheart. In the church, all followers rescind their real name for a personal name Shah gave them and the dark deed they performed for her in order to demonstrate their loyalty and win that name. And for a little girl to torture her parents, it would be fitting to be awarded the name Shadowheart. Now you might be thinking, what did Shadowheart's family do to deserve this terrible fate? It's revealed by Shah that Shadowheart's parents are fanatics of Saluna. They were among the most fanatical of my sister, Saluna's followers. But for years they have been here, resisting my embrace. Reading notes in the Secret Temple reveals that Shadowheart had been specifically targeted and tracked for some time. These are all about me. Forty years of my life documented like I was some sort of specimen. It would be a great triumph for Shah to capture a child from a family of Saluna, raise her as a Sharon, and have her personally punish her parents for eternity. Depending on your previous choices with Night Song and the Dark Justicia quest, the dialogue with Shah here will vary. If you have saved Night Song, your choice with Shadowheart's parents will be a lot more complicated. That painful mark on Shadowheart's hand is shown to react to her parents. This is Shah's grip on her. They are all connected, and to sever this connection, Shadowheart's parents must die. Enough! I'm taking my parents away from here. I'm taking them away from you! You cannot. We are still bound to you. You cannot both free us and free yourself from her curse. Doing this will mean that Shadowheart can truly be free from Shah, no longer dealing with the pain in her hand, but now having the pain and knowledge that she killed her parents. On the other hand, freeing her parents means she will sacrifice her freedom to always be a pawn and plaything for Shah to spitefully twist the blade in her wound whenever she pleases. Both options have pain, and both options bring pleasure to Shah. It's a pretty messed up choice to say the least. I chose to free Shadowheart's parents to give her a chance to have a real family instead of a cult and a spiteful goddess as a surrogate mother. If you chose for Shadowheart to kill her parents in the light path, as she heartbreakingly puts it, Loss. Actual loss, not Shah's oblivion. I had my family for too short a moment. Now they're gone. By my hand. Now she's experiencing actual loss with no option to forget this time. Shah is a sore loser. She wishes for everyone to experience pain like the pain she felt when her sister Saluna ignited the sun that burned and destroyed her domain of darkness. She is regarded as bitter and vengeful for this, but in truth, maybe she just wants to bring together all the lonely individuals, those who had been wronged like her, those who have lost like her, to have a safe place to come together, lick each other's wounds and indulge in doses of amnesia. But as we know, this was never for their own benefit. This is for Shah. So she does not have to feel so alone. So she can be the mother figure. She can be the one in control. And she can be the one.
to inflict loss. Thank you everybody so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this first video on Baldur's Gate, um, Forgotten Realms, d and they're all wrapped up in a really awesome universe with so much source material to uncover. If you enjoyed this and you want to know about more gods and how they appear in game or other characters as well, please let me know. Thank you all so 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 much and a special thank you to my channel members and patrons.